All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Let's go ahead and get, ahead and get started for the FTA portion. And for those of you who were here for the morning session, apologies. You're going to hear a lot of the same information. But um, And for those of you in the back, we've got plenty of room at the table if you'd like to, to join us. And I don't know if we do we still have, there's somebody there. Do we still have folks on the phone? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. And we also have some folks on the phone. So if those those of you on the phone who are joining us fresh, um, you're going to be muted, but please feel free to use the chat feature if you have questions and we will take them as we go. And since we do have some new folks joining us, let's go ahead and do some introductions. I'm Kelly McGurdy, the Director of Transportation Planning here at PSRC. We'll go this way now. I'm Kim Pearson, PSRC. Catherine Cotto, PSRC. Joanna Valencia, Seattle. Jim Storman, Seattle. <clears throat> Christian Agrawal, Washington Ferries. Tyler Benson, Sound Transit. Kenneth Wilson, Sound Transit. Ryan Tomto, PSRC. Sarah Gutcha, PSRC. Mitch Cook, PSRC. Ned Dunn, Seattle Center. Steve Levengood, Seattle Center. Megan Ching, Seattle Center Monorail. Sound Transit. Monica Overby, Sound Transit. Heather Rochelle, Sound Transit. Chris Lynch, City of Kirkland. Melissa Colley, Community Transit. Dave Morris in King County Metro. Peter Heffern in King County Metro. Okay, there's a lot of, I, so I, I, I will apologize for the folks who sat through this before, um, you know, check the news on your phone. But for those who weren't joining us on the phone, we're gonna run through a lot of the same information, but why don't you go ahead and go to the first slide. Um, so for those of you who were not here for the, the 9 a.m. workshop, we're going to do a, a high flyover of the project selection process in general, including all of the different um, competitions that we're going to conduct. Um, we're going to spend some time focusing on the FTA funding processes and the regional FTA competition once we get through that. And then Mitch is going to walk through the online forms and applications. And again, for those of you on the phone, feel free to text us with your questions. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Sarah Gutcho from PSRC, and thank you for attending our workshop. So we're, as Kelly said, we're going to be going through a lot of information about the Federal Transit Administration project selection process. And you may have heard a bit of it before, but um, if you attended this morning's workshop, but we have four concurrent projects on the federal high, um, processes on the Federal Highway Administration side, we have our regional competition and countywide competitions. And then on the Federal Transit Administration side, we have the regional competition and the earned share and preservation distributions. The grand total of all of that funding is 533 million that we will be distributing as part of this, the 2020 process. We also want to note there are a few other funding programs at PSRC that will not be conducted as part of this process. That's the Rural Town Centers and Corridors Program and the Transportation Alternatives Program on the FHWA side. On the FTA side, we also have the Special Needs Transportation Program. Those project, or those processes are conducted in off years on more of an ad hoc basis. So for all of the processes that we just mentioned, there are a lot of commonalities. They follow the policy direction from the board. Um, the policy framework for PSRC's federal funds that was most recently adopted in January of 2020. All the processes need to follow regional policies and procedures. So they need to be at the highest level consistent with Vision 2040, our regional long range plan, and the regional transportation plan most re recently adopted in 2018. They need to be consistent with the local comprehensive plans. And then all of these plans funnel down to um, the bottom of the funnel, which is the project selection process. They also need to follow the federal and state requirements, be competitive and meet federal funding program requirements, and all uh, phases need to be fully funded. So the policy framework that we mentioned, it's adopted prior to each funding cycle. Um, and for each, fund, for each of these processes take place every two, sometimes three years. We use the project selection process to program funds into the future. And this 2020 process will be distributing funds for Fiscal, federal fiscal years 2023 and 2024. The policy framework is based on the policies in Vision 2040. And as Ryan noted earlier, um, we are using Vision 2040 because Vision 2050 is not adopted yet. It's still in the process. So it'll be adopted later this year in case you have any questions about that. 
Um, and what the purpose of the policy framework is to do is to provide board direct, uh, direction to the board for project selection, for the actual awarding of funds, and then it, they provide uh, very detailed information on the different policies and procedures that will take place as part of the project selection process. So we'll be going into more detail on all of these elements, but the main elements that are within the policy framework, and if you'd like to view the entire policy framework, it's available on our website under the call for projects, are the funding estimates, funding set-asides for the FTA side, that would include the preservation set-aside and the FTA minimum floor, um, detailed information on each of those processes, and the project evaluation criteria, and some other administrative details for how the projects, how the processes are run. So the policy focus is on the whole support for centers and quarters that serve them, but the policy focus varies slightly depending on which of the uh, project selection processes you're talking about. For the FHWA regional competition, a center is defined as a regional growth center or a manufacturing industrial center. For the FHWA countywide competitions, that is expanded to include um, locally identified centers, which includes military facilities as locally identified centers. And for the FTA regional side, um, that includes regional growth centers, manufacturing industrial centers, and also locally identified centers would all be defined as support for centers and quarters for the FTA process. And to touch on this briefly, and Ryan can also answer any questions you might have about FHWA funds, the FHWA side uses two different programs, the uh, Surface Transportation Program, or STP, which is a flexible program for funding roadway transit bicycle pedestrian and freight projects, as well as the Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program, or CMAC, which is more focused on projects that provide a specific air quality benefit. And both programs include a 13.5% match requirement. The FTA funds uses four other programs. The FTA programs are all transit related and they support transit related activities, but what's defined as a transit related activity is actually pretty flexible depending on what funding source you're using. And we also wanna mention that the FTA funds are eligible to both transit agencies as well as local agencies, which can also apply if they have concurrence from a transit agency. And we will provide a little more detail about how a local agency can have concurrence from a transit agency. As an example of a project that a local agency could do would be an access to transit project because all the FTA funds are eligible for any project for uh, bicycle and pedestrian facilities within the certain catchment area, that's three miles for bicycle facilities and 0.5 miles for pedestrian facilities. So to go in the, the specific funding programs that we're uh, distributing as part of the 2020 project selection process, we have section 5307 urbanized area. This is a very, very flexible program. It can fund planning, capital, as well as other things like operations or education and training. If you'll notice, if you look at our eligibility document, which describes all the different project activities that are eligible for these different funding sources, for 5307, the list is about two pages long because it's a very wide variety. Um, for the other sections, there's 5337, State of Good Repair. This is exclusively for preservation and maintenance projects. And this is only for services that have been in operation for at least seven years. This is divided between two different tiers. That's fixed guideway, which is more of the funding, and that's for things like passenger only ferry or light rail, and high intensity motor bus is the other tier, and that is specifically for bus services that operate on high occupancy, high occupancy vehicle lanes. The last funding source is section 5339 for bus and bus facilities, and this one is a little bit more flexible than state of good repair, but can only be used for bus and bus facilities. However, for buses, this can be used for replacement, rehabilitation, as well as capital projects for facilities, as well as um, vehicle replacements. So all of these programs have a required 20% match, local match, which is a little bit higher than the FHWA 13.5%. So how do we receive these funds? Um, all, four, all three of these, or four of these funding sources, um, come to the PSRC region to three, the three urbanized areas that are defined within the PSRC region are Bremerton, Marysville, and Seattle, Tacoma, Everett. The way these come to the region are that Congress allocates a certain amount to each funding program, and then the FTA uses formulas that are applied nationally to distribute them to different um, UZAs. So part of the formula is based on operating characteristics like uh, vehicle revenue miles or operating costs, 
which is the sum total of all the service provided by the transit agencies in that UZA. The other portion comes from regional attributes like population density or low income population, which apply to the entire region. So that portion goes to the regional competition and set asides, whereas the, earn, the operating characteristics goes to earn share. So what PSRC does is we look at the national formulas and we figure out what portion comes from each of those two types of data points and we distribute them um, into those two different pots. So the earned share goes to Bremerton Marys and Marysville exclusively because they on, each only have one transit agency that's Kitsap Transit and Community Transit, uh, whereas Seattle Tacoma Everett uses both an earned share and a regional distribution. So what does this actually look like? We have our overall PSRC regional funds and they're distributed to Marysville, Bremerton and Seattle Tacoma Everett. And as I mentioned, Marysville and Bremerton only get earned share funds. Then for Seattle Tacoma Everett, we break these up among the regional side, which is about 14% of the total, and then the earned share side, which represents about 86% of the total. And then the next step is to, for the regional side, about 45% or 45% goes to the preservation set aside, a smaller amount goes to the minimum floor, and then the remainder is left over for the regional competition, which is what we'll more be focusing on today. And then we'll also be talking about the earned share side. Um, and we also wanted to mention that there are three external transit agencies which also receive funds because they provide services to the PSRC region. That's Kitsap Transit, Intercity Transit, and Skagit Transit. And they are eligible to receive the earned share funds. So what does this look like in terms of the funding breakdown? Um, you can see that Bremerton and Marysville receive a portion of the earned share funds. And then Seattle Tacoma Everett has the remaining 367 amount. Um, which is broken out between the earned share and the set aside amounts and the regional competition. So the total is about 380 million for the 2023-2024 process. So these are the amounts that have been approved for to be distributed for this upcoming process. Sarah, just a quick note. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a more detailed chart in the call for yep. projects that lists the earned share amounts and preservation amounts by agency. Mm -hmm. Yes, for full details. Okay, and so the, we'll just um, go over the project selection process for the FHWA at a high level, and please let us know if you have questions about this. Um, and I think I mentioned already, but we ha do have workshops coming up. We had one earlier today for King County, and then we have one in each of the, four, uh, the other three counties um, the rest of the week. And the flyer is also on the Call for Projects website. So for the FHWA side, there is a regional competition, which has a limited number of applications and a regional focus. And then there is the countywide competitions, which follows the policy framework that was adopted as well as the priorities that are adopted by each county. This is how the uh, rural minimum is distributed as well as set asides, including the preservation and the bicycle pedestrian set asides. For both of these processes, there's, um, they're restricted to single phase requests or preliminary engineering phases plus one subsequent phase, so right of way or construction. So as we'll be getting a deeper dive into the criteria, but at this point, I just want to pause to see if there are any questions about anything we went over so far. This might be new to some of you and others might have seen this a few times. Okay, so let us know if you have questions, but um, we'll be talking more in depth about all the criteria that we use to score the actual project submitted. And that only applies for the criteria to the project submitted for regional funding. So the project selection um, evaluation criteria is divided into support for centers, safety, mobility, and accessibility, population served, um, emissions reduction, uh, project readiness, and financial plans. And then I also want to mention there are some non-scored elements um, that we could call other considerations. It's a little confusing. They aren't scored, but they could factor into uh, project recommendations at the end of the process after the initial scoring process. So that includes things like innovations and cost benefit benefits. Okay. And then um, we also want to mention our project tracking requirements. The, the broad purpose of our project tracking requirements is that we want to make sure that after the projects are actually recommended for funding, that the applicants are using those funds and using them the way they said they would use them and accomplishing the scope they said they would accomplish. 
So that's the general broad purpose, but more specifically, um, we are trying to ensure an efficient use of PSRC funds, that projects are delivered in a timely manner with uh, fewer delays. Um, and in order to track that, we have been updating our policies over time. If you haven't looked at them recently, we have a um, updated version on our website under call for projects. Um, and it has some clarified policies for the FTA projects, but no new policies. Um, so to monitor uh, the project tracking, we have two main ways of doing this. We collect progress reports twice a year to check the use of funds and the scope that's being accomplished. And then for FTA funds, we also monitor on a very regular basis to make sure they are adhering to the policies for FTA fund project tracking. So for regional funds, which includes both the regional competitive funds and the preservation set aside funds, um, they have a one year grace period beyond their estimated obligation date to actually obligate the funds or else are at risk of being returned to the regional funding pot and distribute, redistributed to another project. For the earned share funds, we do not have that policy, but we do monitor to make sure they do not um, go over their FTA defined lapse date and they do not leave the region. So here is a very high level schedule for the entire project selection process. What's already happened was that in January 2020 that we, the uh, executive board and transportation policy board adopted the 2020 policy framework. On February 3rd, just um, two weeks ago, we released the call for projects, which has all the information in more detail that you'll see on the website. Um, this week, we are holding workshops in each county. So as I mentioned, the FTA one today, as well as for FHWA workshops. Um, and then this really kicks off our project selection process. So we'll be go going over the deadlines that are relevant to that in a moment. Um, but this will uh, start in February and go until July 2020. and that will include the application process, road screening forms, applications, followed by project recommendations, um, followed by the projects actually being recommended but to our committees and boards. Um, and we'll conclude with the actual adoption of the project recommendations by the executive board in July. That the projects will then go out for public comment in September of 2020, um, followed by board adoption in October of 2020. And Last but not least, they will be uh, adopted uh, federally in 2021 for the regional tip for 2021 to 2024. So this is important for um, the key deadlines for what to uh, watch out for. We have some coming up shortly for the regional FHWA. This initial screening forms are due on March 2nd. Um, so just to go over what the screening forms are, um, the reason we were asked for screening forms is it's a chance for PSRC to provide some early commentary and review projects for eligibility. So we review the scope, the budget, and the funding uh, eligibility, funding program eligibility for each project to make sure that they are eligible. And we pro provide comments to inform your application submittals. Um, so those screening forms for FHWA are due March 2nd for the countywide process, March 20th through April 3rd. They're each set by each countywide process. Um, and then for FTA earn share, that's due April 6th. So, so you have a little bit of time there. Um, and FTA regional is due on March 23rd. Um, so we will review the screening forums and then the actual grant application deadlines will be for the regional FHWA April 8th. Um, countywide FHWA also varies by countywide process. And the FTA regional applications will be due April 27th. And I should also mention we have earn share does not submit applications using our application form, but they do need to submit um, their um, project information based on what they submit in their screening form. So it's a slightly different process. So the FTA regional competition, if you uh, were part of this in a previous year, it's similar in the sense that there's no limit on the number of applications or the funding requests. However, the awarding amount, the amounts that will actually be rewarded is going to be limited by the funding amounts available by year. So obviously we have a certain amount available by year. Um, so we can't go over that amount, <clears throat> but we do not have limits on how many applications can apply or how much funding they can request in each individual application. Um, as I mentioned, the policy focus is always support for centers and the quarters that serve them, which includes for FTA, both regional growth centers, manufacturing industrial centers and locally identified centers. And as with the other processes, the, all phases must be fully funded with the requested award as well as other sources. 
So Sarah, we're going to pause because we have a question from sure. the, the phone to repeat the difference between the earned share and the regional competition. So I think the, the response might simply be maybe just reiterating the, um, the distribution pathways for those. Sure. So the earned share funds come to the region based on operating characteristics, where the regional funds come based on regional characteristics. So the earned share funds make up 86% and the regional funds make up 14% and the regional funds are distributed between only for the Seattle Tacoma Everett use, uh, urbanized area are broken up between a preservation set aside, which is open to transit agencies. Um, and then the regional competition, which is open to transit agencies, as well as um, local jurisdictions that would like to apply in the, the regional competition, which we're going over. Okay, I think I, one final key point is that the so the earned share because of how the funds are coming to the region, those funds are distributed back to the transit agencies based on the service that they're providing, yeah. and then the balance is for a, a, an actual competition for projects to be submitted. So hopefully that answers that question. It's a little complicated. Yeah. I've been through this biannual process a few times, but I realize I paid much more attention to FHWA side, so I'm hearing a couple things that didn't quite sound as I expected. I want to just clarify, so on the earned share process, if we're an agency that would expect to receive the earned share funds, uh, do we still go through, or do we need to be proactive in terms of going to your website, filling out the screening forms and other activities? We're not waiting for uh, outreach from you, <clears throat> in other words, to to identify the amounts that, were, that are allocated to us and what, what next steps we take? Uh, we will send out information with the amounts allocated to you. We have not sent that out yet, but we will be sending it out pretty shortly. But we do have, so we have the, I don't think we have it by funding source, but within the call for projects, we do have the yeah. sums to each agency, um, as well as the screening form deadline. But yeah, the details by funding source, we can send that out. Yeah, we'll be sending that out um, in the next, hopefully by next upcoming weeks. So, okay, Melissa? Um, am I crazy or... Do we yes. always, yeah, we know that. That was a, that was a big softball. Um, have we always had to do screening forms for earned share? Maybe because I don't do it. it <laughs> yeah, especially with the with Map 21 and the Fast Act, because the sources are so persnickety. Yeah. So obviously the budget we need to review as well as the requests, but then we spend a lot of time looking at eligibility requirements, especially for new projects, to make sure they fit each program. Okay, so on to the project evaluation criteria. So the full score is 100 points, which is a nice even number, and that's broken out between 75 points for the category specific questions, which includes benefit to centers as well as system continuity. And then the remaining 25 points are technical criteria, which includes air quality and climate change, uh, project readiness and financial plan, and then it's listed here, but other considerations receive zero points. So um, the ones that actually receive points are the technical criteria and then the quarter serving centers. So we'll go through what each of these actually mean. Um, so for what the benefit to center policy criteria is, so for um, we want to be able to provide some guidance on how to answer each of these questions um, and for any supporting information you provide for the criteria, we want to make sure that what you're providing has a clear nexus between the criteria and the data you're providing. We don't just need extraneous information that is just about the benefits of the project. We want to make sure it actually meets the criteria being asked for. So I have a few examples for each of these about how previous applicants have done this. Um, for housing and employment, you can use housing and employment data, support for transit-oriented development. Um, for plans and activities, you can use um, examples of current and future developments in the area um, or cite some long-range plans and studies that uh, support this activity or support this project. Um, for range of travel modes and access to a center, including active transportation, we prefer if you say actual facilities instead of just saying this will help pedestrians or bicyclists or um, support transit. Um, so the more specific, the better here. Um, and similarly for benefits to user groups, rather than just citing demographic data that says something like 10% of the population here is our seniors or disabled, that doesn't mean as much as saying this project is on a corridor with four nursing homes and this specific project will help them get those residents get to where they need to be. Um, we also include uh, vulnerable populations in there. So similarly, the more specific, the better for the actual benefits provided. Um, for 
the establishment of jobs and businesses. Here's somewhere, another place you could cite business data, talk about employment clusters in the region. Um, you can also talk about partnerships with local businesses that you already are pursuing or have um, that support the project. And similarly, for commute trip reduction, if you talk about current programs that impact the area, and specifically uh, CTR affected work sites in the area that can be helpful for supporting this uh, criteria question. So I want to I want to add to this. So it's it's important. Don't talk. You're not your project isn't supporting the corridor. Your project is supporting the center. So whatever center it is that you're tying to, make sure you look at what the jurisdiction or your own transit development plan says about that center. So again. Don't tell us how it's going to improve the corridor. Tell us how the improvement on the corridor is going to help that center. So what does the center say about um, what is the housing and employment in the center? What are the jobs in the center? Um, what are the policies and plans and activities for that center? And how is that project supporting it? So as Kelly was saying, um, for system continuity, um, for provides a logical segment, we want to hear specifically how it serves the center, not just that it's a good project or a beneficial project. We want it to address the actual criteria. Um, for missing link relieves bottlenecks or removes barriers, you do not need to explain how the project fulfills all of these, but it has to fill me at least one of these criteria. So explaining the actual problem it's, that's being addressed and how it meets or solves that problem. And this is a good place if you want to include information about some of the public support for the project. So that could be examples of prior investments that you've already that you or local jurisdiction has already taken to help um, relieve this uh, barrier or bottleneck um, or uh, fill this missing link. Um, so other coordination among agencies or other examples of to really show that this is a, a recognized problem in the area. Um, for safety and security, um, you can provide crash data here if you do not have crash data or there hasn't actually been any crashes here or safety issues, you can talk about ways that there might be future safety or security issues. You can also talk about security here, not just safety. So um, security enhancements would be helpful here as well. Um, for intermodal connections, um, rather than just saying, naming the different modes it might support, I'm talking about the specific connections. So if it meets three different bus routes, then you can name the bus routes. Um, that helps us fill in a little bit better picture of what the project is doing. Um, and then similarly for travel time or reliability, um, when you talk about the actual reliability, it's helpful to know if there's currently delay issues there and how this will, how this project is projected to improve those delay issues. Um, and for transit use, um, you can also include modeling projections for how this will increase use of the facility, increase ridership for this route. Um, and then finally, for long-term strategies, this is an area where you can cite some long-range plans or um, studies, um, different goals and strategies that the region has already recognized that needs to be that this project will help the region achieve. I want to uh, go back to safety for a moment. Um, we talked talked about this earlier in the FHWA workshop that we know that not every project is going to be addressing a particular accident location. Um, so think a little bit broader on that one and talk about how your project, and we, we've spent some time talking at the committees about how do some of these projects really address safety. Um, but think about in terms of either you're bringing a facility or uh, bringing it up to a, a current standard and maybe the existing area is, is not quite up to standard. So what are the features of your project that aren't necessarily solving an existing problem, but preventing a future problem, or just this facility itself that you're constructing is going to be built in such a way that it's providing um, safer options or providing an improvement over existing conditions. So, so think a little bit about out the box, and um, you know, you don't need to just say there's no safety problem and move on. I think you can probably find a way to sell your projects a little bit more because these are these are current, and I'm sure that there's going to be features that are um, perhaps you think are standard, but they m might not be in existence in a facility that was built 20 years ago. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Kelly for air quality. Yeah, so um, you are going to be um, selecting the elements that are included in your project when you get to this part of the application, and you're going to just tell us what's uh, what's included in your project, and then there are going to be questions given to you specific to that. So um, each transportation project can uh, reduce emissions in a variety of ways. If you're and since we're talking about transit projects, 
reducing trips. So if you're actually inducing a mode shift out of single occupant vehicle onto transit, that's going to reduce trips. Mm -hmm. If you're building a park and ride, there might still be a trip component, but you're certainly reducing vehicle miles traveled. If you're doing uh, business access transit lanes or transit signal priority, you're potentially improving travel flow and reducing vehicle idling. Or if you're converting um, a diesel bus to a hybrid electric or an electric bus, all of their or other uh, source, all of those could be reducing emissions. And again, depending on what's included in your project, we have specific questions that'll help guide you in terms of providing that information. Uh, PSRC will be doing um, the technical analysis of this. So we have uh, national and regional default information on a variety of different types of projects so that we will use that. We can't estimate the potential from your project, but if you have project specific information, you're welcome to use that, but we want to make sure that it's sourced appropriately. So it has to be from a study, a traffic analysis, an EIS, something um, so that we can say, yes, we're going to use that project specific data as opposed to the, the, the national defaults. Okay. The last uh, project evaluation criteria we'll go over is project readiness financial plan. Um, so for this criteria, we're trying to make sure that the project will be ready to use PSRC funds by the requested date. Um, so the way we ask for that information is we're looking at the prerequisites for the schedule for achieving the prerequisites for obligation and other project milestones, as well as the full project budget and financial plan. Ryan, do you have anything to add there? <laughs> Um, okay, so are there any questions on the general, on each of the criteria we went over? And the full criteria is also available as part of the call for projects with, with a bit more detail. So lastly, um, before we get into the actual materials available and the forms, the online forms, um, we'll go over some of the just general tips for completing applications and how high scoring projects in the past, how some tips for how to get a higher score. Um, for Generally speaking, being clear and concise, as uh, Ryan mentioned earlier, there are actual humans reading your applications. We do not have a Scantron we feed this into, which is going to look for specific keywords. We read each and every word that you put in your application. So the easier it is for us to follow and the less extraneous information, um, less copy and pasting, the better. Um, but with that said, we want you to be clear and concise, but we also want you to be thorough. So don't skip any questions. Don't just put X or NA. Um, and address every criteria to the best of your ability, um, as well as uh, making sure there's a full information there. This may be a project that you know extremely well, but it will be completely new to us and we may not know, be familiar with the area at all. Um, so just assume we do not live in the region and we are completely new to everything. Um, so the better information you can provide about the project, the better, including, the, the, including maps and graphics to help illustrate what the project is, so the actual uh, site plan, the plans for the project at the site, as well as where it is within the region. Um, and also just to mention, we have uh, scored a lot of projects where, and sometimes we spend more time figuring out what the project is and where it is, and then figuring out what the actual benefits are and how it addresses the criteria. So focus, make sure that the scope of work is very clear and also know which part of, which part of the scope of work will be accomplished using PSRC funds being applied to, uh, being applied for. Um, the other couple of points, the policy focus, as we mentioned, is support for centers. So even if you have a wonderful project with a lot of benefits, if it doesn't support the centers that you've designated and identified, um, it will not score as well because it does not meet the criteria. And then lastly, for your project readiness, um, make sure that your schedule and financial plan are all feasible um, that the awards that you included as part of, or that the funds you included as part of your financial plan are not just ones you're applying for, that they're ones that you actually have. So, well, so we have a question from the phone. Uh, when do projects need to be completed when using the funds? And I'm going to take a stab at this. So we don't, at PSRC does not have a specific requirement for completing the project. It depends on what phase you're requesting and the deadlines are around um, using the funds for that phase. I'm more familiar on the highway side, there's a general 10-year clock to get from one phase to the other. I'm not sure about on the FTA side. They, I think USDOT in general expects progress to be made on these projects, but again, it depends on what phase you're requesting, but we know that many of these are long-term projects that are going to take 
you know, many years to, to, to move forward. So I don't know if anyone in the room knows if FDA has a specific clock like the highway side does, but focus more on making use of the funds along the time frame that you're requesting and making progress on that phase, but there's no set deadline from us anyway as to when the project itself has to be completed. All right, so I will turn it over to Mitch to go over the key resources that we have available as part of the call for projects. We've mentioned a few of them, so we can actually go take a look at them as well as the online forms for answering the criteria. Hello, um, so we have several online resources and guidance documents as well as the applications um, online. Um, this is kind of a summary of those. Um, I'll go into more detail on the actual website though. Um, and this is the link to the project selection resources page. Um, we just put it in here just in case people need it uh, to reference um, in the future. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is the project selection page on PSRC's website. Um, the first section is the call for projects information, including the schedule, uh, workshop flyer, and um, the policy framework for PSRC federal funds. Um, in this section, it also includes the map of areas eligible uh, for various funds um, and the map of regionally designated centers. Um, uh, so please feel free to read through this information uh, before you submit your applications and screening forms. Um, and this section is the criteria and resources uh, section um, and includes um, the regional project evaluation criteria as well as the checklist and resources for applicants while they're submitting their screening forms and uh, uh, funding applications. Um, note that there's the screening form checklist for FTA as well as FHWA, this will be very helpful for applicants when they're submitting their screening form to ensure they have all these components um, readily available and included in their forms. Um, and if you have any questions, you can contact us, of course. Um, there's also the FTA application checklist, which is very similar, but this is specifically for the funding application um, after you've received feedback from the screening form from PSRC. Um, um, there's also the link to the project selection resource map. Um, so ignore that. Um, uh, so this bar allows you to um, select an area that uh, if you want to zoom into an area, for instance, Bellevue, um, that'll just do that. And then at this point, you could zoom in, zoom out scroll around the map if needed. Um, for whatever reason, maybe it's the screen size, there is a button right here that says more information. And if you click that, that'll give a detailed list of all of these uh, legend components um, and talk about the data sources uh, of how we receive this data, um, if that's helpful to you all. Um, this is where so this section shows the components that we can show on this map. So you could look at, uh, for instance, freight routes. Um, maybe. So regional growth centers. I don't know why freight routes is not showing right now. Um, <laughs> right. So in a perfect world, usually this works fine. Um, it was working earlier today. Okay. Um, anyway, so you can show, you can look um, to see where uh, centers are, which can help with the centers criteria. You can also use these uh, demographic uh, layers, uh, which can help answer criteria related to user groups and equity. Um, yeah, um, so for the poverty population, senior, I don't know. What, uh, let me just try this. I don't know why that's. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, 
I'm okay. Sorry about that. I oh, just wanted to mention that if you do want to use this as part of your application, you can either mm. take a screenshot or do a print screen or yeah, go to the three dots in the corner and do a print screen. Um, yeah, and you can use that this as part of your application if that's helpful. Um, so. so since the map isn't working to show the demographic data, it will work. We'll make sure it works once, as soon as we leave this. There's also a guidance document particularly related to the um, support for equity and vulnerable populations. And it walks through much of the information and explains what you'll see on the web map and gives you some tips on how to apply it to your project. Uh, sorry. Okay. And moving along, um, there's also, oh, is that up here? Yeah. Sorry. There's also the FTA concurrent, concurrence um, document. So this is for local agencies that may be requesting FTA funds. Um, you will need to gain uh, concurrence with a transit agency in the region. Um, and this form is what you'll need. Um, and then this form is also for the 5307 program requirements. Um, and then we also have forms related to financial uh, documentation and plans and guidance and um, air quality guidance as well. Um, and for countywide project or competitions, um, this information, oh, I guess this isn't relevant yep. for FGA, sorry. Um, so uh, at this point, we have the applications and screening forms section. Um, you can click this link. Um, and it'll take you to the welcome page, um, at which point for the screening forms, you can click screening forms. Um, I have a, uh, a screening form already filled out that I'll walk through um, right now. I could just mm -hmm. add real quick that when you click that link, he was already logged in, so it went to the um, welcome page, but when you initially go there, there'll be the login. So you would just use your same, uh, same login credentials that you would use to log into the tip. Um, and if you need, if you don't have that information, you need it, just give us a call or uh, shoot us an email and we'll connect you with the uh, credentials. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so this is the first page of the screening form, um, the introduction page. At this point, you can select which competition you would like to uh, use your application for. Um, there's regional FDA and FDA earned share. If you're uh, competing for preservation set aside, you will need to select the earn share option. Oh. Um, and then uh, throughout the uh, screening form, you can select, and the funding application for that matter, you can select this uh, link, the view download PDF link, and it will uh, produce a PDF for your records if needed. Um, and then the next page is just the general project information. This is uh, very straightforward. Uh, contact information, uh, project description and location. Um, here we just want the components of the project. We don't need uh, the justification or purpose of your project. That will come later. Um, this tab is just the federal functional class classification, um, so just selecting this based on these options. Um, and at any point, uh, there's various links throughout the application to guidance uh, and also uh, contact information for relevant staff if you need help uh, during the application process. Um, and during the application, you can always hit, you can hit the save next button, which will allow you to save your progress um, at, up to that point. Um, so you can come back later and finish your application. Um, if you leave a uh, if you leave a question blank, um, you'll get an error and you will not be able to proceed until you complete that question um, throughout the application. Mitch, maybe remind them that you're they're seeing the the full list on the left hand mm -hmm. side because you've completed it, but so you you won't you can't skip ahead. You can only mm -hmm. go backwards. Yeah, so hypothetically, you would not see all of this. You would only see these tabs if it, this was a brand new application. Uh, but yes, and once you're through the application, you can bounce back to previous uh, pages to edit if needed. Um, and then this page is just asking for bike and ped accommodations. And you can select, um, in this case, I said no. But if you said yes, you could select these options. 
um, and this is asking for a reason as to why um, there are no bike pad facilities included in the project. Um, this tab is just asking for plan consistency with local comprehensive plans, um, yes or no, and if yes, you identify uh, which plans, and if not, you explain why not. Um, the project readiness tab is just asking for milestones uh, for the project timeline. And then at this point, it's uh, this page is the PSRC funding request. So just asking what type of funds are being requested, um, as well as um, the phase amount requested and the year of those dollars being requested. And it's important to note that while we try to fulfill this, uh, the year, it may not be guaranteed um, just based on the other um, applications. Um, and then uh, you'll get to the total estimated project cost and schedule. Um, so here we're looking for the complete uh, project cost. Um, so this includes any all phases of the project and we want to know the funding source, the, the status, and the amount, as well as the expected completion date for each phase. Um, so, um, and then after this, you'll hit the financial documentation page. Um, here you just can just describe the financial documentation if there's any specific information that you'd like us to know, and then you can upload files related to this, um, including TEIS, grant awards, or local TIP documents. Um, just for the last page, if you are filling out an earn share screening form, please, if you are including both preservation set aside and earn share funds, please use a different row for each of those types of funds so we can delineate it better as part of the eligibility. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll hit the final page, the final review page. Um, so at this point, you're not completely done. You have to actually hit the submit button or PSRC will not receive your application. Um, so that's very important. Um, and once you do that, PSRC will receive it and you'll also receive an email with your, a PDF of your application for your records. Um, if you have any questions or so, before you hit submit, if you'd like, you're welcome to go back through the application and make any edits if needed. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, you can contact Catherine or myself um, and so once it's submitted, PSRC staff will review the screening form. Um, it's important to note screening forms aren't for scoring. They're specifically to inch, um, review eligibility for the project selection competition itself. Um, so we'll provide feedback and return the screening form with feedback uh, to the applicants. And at that point, you can uh, fill out an, a funding application and that and that's what actually is scored for the project selection process. Maybe just some, um, based on our experience on the FTA side doing the screening forms, I think the bulk of our questions probably in the follow-ups probably have to do with financial documentation, making sure that we can verify that your financial plan for the phase in question is reasonable. So providing that supporting documentation. And then the other things we tend to see, um, maybe some eligibility related to the 5337 or 5339 and I think the other one and I'm looking to the three of you to verify this the other common catch we see is trying to understand the relationship of this request to an existing project if there's that tie and just making sure we're fully understanding what the new funds are doing compared to um, existing funds in that project any other tips that we can think of off the top of our heads for FTA screening common pitfalls I think that's it. yes. So one question, I think for those projects that are ongoing projects, we've set up a process, at least at King County, to every time we build a new tip, we start those buckets over. That's great. Would you want us to refer to the previous project and what you just mentioned or start all over? It's a fresh project that makes it much easier. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I would just say for bicycle and pedestrian accommodations, that's not going to apply to some types of transit projects like vehicle purchases, but still provide a clear reason using the guidance provided on why, if you're not including bicycle and pedestrian facilities, why not? That's one of our common follow-ups. Yeah, so. that's a USDOT policy, so that's why that's there. Uh, Monica? In, sorry, can you... 
Is it is it true? Am I or am I making this up? We can't submit to both FHWA and FTA for the same project. Is that right? Correct. What uh, if it's like a the exact two so, different elements? Yeah, that you project? can do if it's a different scope of the same project or a different phase. But we said don't submit for the same phase for the same project in both regional competitions. Okay, okay. that's Thank a you. good reminder. Yeah, Jim. I've always thought of this as the 5307 competition. So good reminder, there's actually three colors of money, uh, particular to the fixed guideway money. I think that's the 5337. Hope you can uh, help me understand how that money flows, both where, where it's distributed, whether on the uh, the competitive side or the formula side, and then what types of projects it typically goes to. Are those rail projects historically, or uh, are we using the FTA definition where other types of projects that would include trolley or dedicated lanes would also be competitive for that money? So the regional competition is 5307 only, and I'll let Sarah answer the other funding source eligibility. Sure, so 5337 is divided into two tiers. So one is fixed guideway, so that would include things like the streetcar or the monorail or any other fixed guideway eligible project, including passenger only ferries. Um, the caveat there is that the service needs to have been in service for at least seven years. Um, the other tier is motor bus, so that would only be for buses that operate within a high occupancy vehicle lane. Um, and both uh, tiers are distributed through the earn share um, distribution method. So if you are eligible to receive that, you'll receive that as part of the earn share process, and then you can decide how to divvy that up. And so, so um, also with the city of Seattle and actually with the, the monorail, and, and we fall under, I believe, the earned share and also the minimum floor. So I guess my question, do I understand correctly that the the capping of the minimum floor at a 2015 level is already baked into the 23-24 process? Yes, that's correct. So that was decided as part of the 2020 policy framework to retain the 2015 cap for the earned share set aside. Yeah. Oh, then, sorry, the minimum floor set aside. All right. But it would be an option to present a project that would be in addition to that minimum floor amount. Is that correct? So the minimum floor is baked into the estimates that Seattle will receive. So we'll inform you of how much funding Seattle will receive from each of the funding sources for which you're eligible to receive funding based on the estimates that you can see available on our website. And then based on using that funding amount, you can only divvy up the funding amount you receive as part of the estimates. Um, and you may have an opportunity as part of our annual adjustments process if you receive additional funding, but for this process, we're only programming into the future with the estimates that we um, have adopted. That oh. might be helpful, um, Mitch, if you can go back to the main page and pull up the FTA funding chart, that might help illustrate, because I think we show each of the, the earned share amounts, the minimum floor, and the preservation set aside. Mitch, it's, it's I think that's what I was trying to answer. Yeah, especially now that we're capped where we are. Um, yes. So, City of Seattle is allowed is eligible to submit projects to the regional competition and has in the past. Um, but City of Seattle, since it's not a designated recipient, would need concurrence from a designated recipient um, using the FTA supplemental agreement that is available there. Um, I think I'm going to estimate. Oh. Yeah. So just for grins and giggles, I think someone answered the question. So if you scroll down to the bottom there, you can see for the, there you go, for each, for the agencies within the Seattle Tacoma Everett UZA, you can see the funky formatting, I don't know how that happened, but the the um, the information by amount, including, we're calling it state of good repair here, but the preservation, the earned share, and then the estimated minimum floor amounts. Mm -hmm. So the earned share is not shown here broken out by funding source, but when we will be sending that information out to each of the agencies <clears throat> shortly. You, um, we have, to my knowledge, we have not had that rule because we have had in the regional competition, you ask for amounts and then 
when you decide during the committee deliberations the years, you have had a project that's had a portion of the funds in one year and a portion of the funds in the second year. They could, they're not going to be very popular. <laughs> It is. We're, it's much less strict on the FTA side. We haven't set those those rules, but yeah, we have had projects that have um, been awarded both both years. Yes. If you yeah. Mm -hmm. Melissa, can you hit your? Yeah. How does pre-award authority work on these funds? <laughs> I'm so sorry, but like, because it, it, yeah. How does that work? <laughs> so we got a, I got a funky question on the highway side, which I promised I need to check with WashDOT to see if you were uh, competing for highway funds. That's a much more complicated answer. But for this, I'm going to attempt to answer this. We don't, PSRC doesn't tend to get involved at all in the pre-award discussion. Right. We are awarding the funds to projects based on the merit and based on we think the funds can be used. It's kind of like um, on the highway side, you either obligate the funds or you have an agreement with FHWA for advanced construction, but that's the agreement in terms of accessing the funds and administering the grant. On the FTA side, I would say that's similar. We're going to award you the funds, and when you're going to work with FTA when you're ready to go and when FTA will allow you to access them, if you have pre-award authority, they might be able to, you might be able to continue to do that work until the funds are available, but that's, quite honestly, that would be between you and FTA. Um, they're 5307 funds, right? So yeah. as long as they're in a current transportation bill, you have pre-award authority on right. all the money, it, correct? When, the, when they're approved in the STIP, January right. Which, 21, right. that's your pre-award date if you meet like the environmental and all right. those Right, that, that is the caveat. Yeah. It's not just a blanket, but right. depending on the project. But these funds the, would meet that criteria because they'll be, in, they'll be put into the TIP in January of 2021. Right. right. Okay. So I think it goes back to the, I think the answer is the same for federal highways and FTA funds. Because I'm of, not convinced that's true, but I, I will find out. Um, but I think it goes back to, I think what people are circling around is a project can start prior to 2023 and be eligible for this competition. If, if the project itself has met the appropriate requirements, I'm not going to give the blanket statement because if, if you haven't reached your environmental, for example, I don't know that something like that would be true. No, I mean, assume right. if a project gets awarded in this process, project starts in 2021, starts expending funds, assuming all the other requirements are met, right. it's not ineligible. So you could have dates on your evaluation of projects starting and being completed prior to these funds being available. So this That's is this is another reason why we have the screening form. So submit your screening form. We'll ask you the milestones. We'll ask you your funding. And if we see something that looks odd, we're going to do a follow-up. And we will probably at that time just confirm that all of those pieces are in place and FDA is saying, yes, you have incurred reimbursable costs. Because that's what it comes down to, is whether or not you've um, deviated from federal rules on the cost that you're incurring, you wouldn't be able to get reimbursed. So if we have any question on that, we will double check it. Yeah, I would just add that FTA has a lot of information about whether or not you can use <clears throat> pre-award authority. And if you do use pre-award authority, as I'm sure you're aware, you are at risk of not being able to use that funding if you haven't met that criteria. In which case, if you don't obligate on time, you wouldn't have met your estimated obligation date as far as, as uh, PSRC's project tracking policies. Yeah. So I know I know we're over, but if it would be helpful in any fun, you are you are welcome. I know some of you have already seen this, but those of you who haven't, Mitch, if you could just quickly run through the application and the pre-population page, um, and then anyone who has more questions, feel free to stick around. Yeah. Um, so at this, so once your uh, screening form is reviewed by PSRC, we'll provide feedback and return that to applicants. And at that point, you can fill out the funding applications. And um, we do so. If you're at the sorry, if you're at the welcome screen, um, you can select funding applications and select new funding application. And then you can choose to pre-populate funding applications with existing screening forms. And here you just select the um, competition. So in this case, regional FTA. Um, and I can just choose an, a submitted uh, FTA application. So and really, really quickly there. So once you click, you want to pre-populate, you select your competition, the list of screening forms you've submitted will show mm -hmm. up. 
So you can select which one you're doing. Yeah, so if you have multiple projects or multiple training forms, you can select any of them. And then the main competition. Um, and at this point, you can't, once you click next here, it'll launch the actual funding application and you can't change this information. If you need to, you'll just have to restart a new application um, and you can use the same, you can create an application with an existing screening form that won't go away or anything, uh, but just that's important to note. This is just assuming like if who, that someone's using all the same login information, right? So like mm -hmm. Catherine does, Catherine does the, the earn share and she has her own login information. I do the regional share, regional competition and I have different login information. And so is, are they different? Per, I think there's only one per agency. Yeah, it's one per agency. It should be. Hmm. I'm not sure that's the okay. case for us. We'll but. <laughs> Uh, okay, so then uh, we created a special one just for you. Right, maybe. <laughs> okay. We'll double check. Um, okay. Oh. Yeah. Um, so at this point, you have the funding application open. So all the pages that were on the screening form will be pre populated, and assuming you don't have any edits to make, uh, that information will be good to go. Um, so I'm just going to skip through that since we're running late. Except for a project description, which uh, the application, oh, will, yeah. yeah. Um, one, so the project description page, um, so you have the project description, which was uh, listed in the screening form. That'll remain the same, um, but you'll also have, uh, oh, oh, does, sorry, does this open? Oh. Does it not include purpose? <laughs> Oh. Um, <laughs> sorry, um, this is slightly different than the federal highway application. Um, it will, so the project description will be worth reviewing just to be sure because of this um, uh, question is different. Um, identifying the center for this project that this project is supporting um, that you will have to fill out. Um, and then, but the federal functional class classification, bike pad accommodations, um, plan consistency, that will all remain the same as the screening form, um, uh, as well as the project readiness pages. Um, and then you'll have, again, your project or your funding request, um, which will remain the same as the screening form. Oh, <laughs> oh. sorry about that. <laughs> Wrong tab. This makes a lot more sense. Um, sorry. So. <laughs> um, backing up, uh, the so those tabs will remain the same, um, but the project description, uh, <laughs> the project description tab will ask for the project scope, which will be pre-populated from the um, funding or sorry from the screening form, and the project, but it will also ask for the project justification, need, and purpose. So this is where you want to ask or list your project benefits and the purpose. Um, and then in the project scope, just keep it strictly to the components of the project. Um, the project location, project consistency, uh, federal functional class classification tabs will all remain the same as the screening form. And this will be a new question, support for centers, so you'll have to fill that out. Just want to mention that uh, for that question, you should identify whatever center you're, or centers okay. you're supporting. So not just describe a relationship, but be specific. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so at this point we get into the actual criteria questions. Um, I'm not going to go through them, but this is where the online guidance and the map tools can help uh, applicants answer these. Um, so there's several pages of this. Um, I'll skip to the air quality page. Um, so at this point you'll select uh, the elements that are relevant to your project. Um, you can select one or multiple, and depending on which ones you select, they'll send you to different pages with uh, different questions related specifically to that element. Um, for this example, I just chose alternative fuels uh, or vehicle technology, um, so it sends me to a page specifically with questions for that element. And again, it's um, criteria questions, yeah, criteria questions that you can answer and there's guidance on the website for this. Um, and then uh, you'll go back, so this, these um, 
pages, the project readiness and financial plan are again, the same as the screening form. So assuming you don't have any edits, uh, you should be able to just skip through these because um, they will be pre-populated uh, as well as the project cost and schedule um, and funding documentation. One thing to note is that your attachments will uh, pre-populate and carry over to the funding application as well as the answers. Um, and then there are additional project readiness questions that aren't on the screen, screening form but are present on the funding application. Uh, these are very straightforward. It just is um, milestones for PE phases, NEPA, um, right-of-way and construction phases. Um, so you can go through those. And then lastly, there's the other considerations tab. Um, these questions won't be scored, but they're required information by our boards. Um, they can factor into the project recommendations. Okay. Um, and then lastly, you'll hit the final review page. And again, you'll want to hit submit or else it will not be submitted to PSRC. Um, and then at that point, we'll do our review and scoring. Um, sorry, that was a very quick overview of the application, but I think that's all I have unless there's questions. So we are over time. So are there any questions before we conclude? Everybody ready for lunch? Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for coming. <laughs>